Hello everyone, I am Eric Senior. I'm the training and content specialist for the National Hispanic and Latino Mental Health and Technology Transfer Center. I would like to welcome you all today to today's webinar. Uh, we are glad to be joined today by our presenter, Jovanska, Dr. Jovanska Duarte Vélez. I'll give a few more minutes uh, while uh, a few more attendees are uh, as everybody keeps joining in. So we'll be, we'll be starting very soon. So I'm going to go ahead and start making a few announcements uh, before we head off with uh, Dr. Duarte Vélez. Uh, as our recent, uh, we were recently celebrating Pride Month and uh, as part of uh, the continuation and the end of Pride Month, we are today, it's the second part of the two-part webinar series, uh, Tailoring Treatment for Gender and Sexually Diverse Latinx Youth with Suicidal Behaviors. Part one was uh, di directed to describe tailored treatment for LGBTQ Latinx youth. That was uh, last Wednesday, June 29th. And today, as, uh, our second part will be directed to explain how to work with uh, caregivers within this model and within this uh, treatment approach. So our, our speaker today is uh, Dr. Duarte Vélez. Dr. Duarte Vélez received her PhD from the University of Puerto Rico and is currently an assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Human uh, Behavior at Brown University and Bradley Hospital. She is also a licensed clinical psychologist with the extensive experience with children and families from diverse backgrounds. Her research interests are to develop and tailor treatment for diverse populations, that is within different ethnicities, sexual orientations, and genders, according to their needs and cultural values. Dr. Duarte Vélez completed a pilot randomized clinical trial uh, with the model of sociocognitive behavioral therapies for suicidal behaviors versus treatment as usual in real world setting with positive results. Currently, she is conducting a randomized clinical trial to test the efficacy and effectiveness of the, this model, sociocognitive behavioral therapy for suicidal behaviors funded by the National Institute of Minority Health and Disparities. One th thing we like to acknowledge is this, this presentation was prepared for the National Hispanic and Latino MHTTC under a cooperative agreement with the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, SAMHSA. Uh, the, the content of today's presentation will be later posted on our website uh, together, together with a recording of the webinar itself. Uh, the MHTTC network uses affirming, respectful, and recovery-oriented language in all its activities. Uh, this language, as you can see, is strength-based and hopeful, non-judgmental, avoiding assumptions, among uh, other, other initiatives as to, in today's webinar. So without further ado, um, I'm going to hand it off and now to uh, our presenter and speaker, uh, Dr. Duarte Vélez. Thank you, Eric. Hello, everyone. Um, happy to be here again. I already um, explained last time, but I will say it again, that I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. And as Eric said, if you can please put the objective just to um, summarize again. So the purpose of this seminar um, was to provide basic information about the relevance of affirmative care for LGBTQ plus Latinx youth, introduce the social cognitive behavioral therapy for suicidal behaviors, and describe tailored treatments for gender and sexually diverse Latinx youth and their caregivers. Um, the first session, we <clears throat> um, explain the um, rationale for doing this work with Latinx youth and their families. We gave uh, some theoretical uh, perspective and approach. We provide some very basic um, data and also a very brief introduction about the uh, study and the study phases, like Eric explained in the introduction of the work I have been doing. And also for the most part, we work with the um, explaining the approach that this treatment have with um, youth. And today we're going to be talking about caregivers. Um, I will encourage everyone to please write in the um, chat the questions that Eric will be seeing 
so we can have some questions at the end. So um, my expectation would be that we could have a little bit more time this time for questions. So please, as soon as you have a questions, write it down in the chat so he can see that and we can try to address that by the end, given that today is the second one. Also, I would like to remember everyone, our um, change model. So every treatment has have some um, target. And the target of this treatment is as every other CVT has cognitions, coping skills and coping skills as some of the target from the uh, adolescent's perspective. Um, the additional aspect that we're covering in terms of the teens, just stay on the other one, yes, is the identity integration. Um, to talk about the importance of the different aspect um, in the adolescent phase that is normal for each teen um, to integrate all those different aspects, including sexual orientation, gender identity. Um, so that's why um, this is an, an additional, I mean, a new model, including the identity integration. And in terms of the family, we're also targeting in this social cognitive behavioral therapy model communication between teens and caregivers, and also support versus conflict, which, which means um, we want to increase the support that caregivers provide to their teens, and we want to decrease the conflict and tensions between them. And also there's many tensions, as we explained before, that arise due to the um, acculturation gap or acculturation conflicts between youth and caregivers, that are even more stronger or more difficult when the teen is from the LGBTQ plus community or is questioning their sexual orientation or their gender identity. So this is a summary. And if we believe if we target those aspects, then the teen will have better outcomes in terms of suicidal behavior and psychological distress overall. So then today I will be explaining how to specifically um, help the caregivers of the LGBTQ teens uh, navigate and support their teens. Our approach, which is support versus conflict, is consonant with the approach of the Family Acceptance Project. And I will ask every, every of you that you please take a picture of this slide, or when you go back to this seminar, you pay attention or write down this, this uh, website that I'm presenting here and the title of that guide guidebook, A Practitioner's Resource Guide Helping Families to Support the LGBT Children. Uh, that is a product of the Family Acceptance Project, which you can find more on that website. They have, they believe that the mediator in treatment outcomes, so means um, how well a teen will do, will depend on how much acceptance the family could achieve. The acceptance in terms of how much they will accept their LGBTQ teen and how bad they will do have to do with the rejection that they receive specifically from their parents. So I will be talking a little bit about their approach and obviously is, as I said, is compatible with ours, just with different names. We talk about support versus conflict. They talk about acceptance versus rejection, which is basically the same. Um, so we use also their materials with our family. Um, as I explained last time, and I would like to uh, remind you about our beliefs in this uh, social cognitive behavioral therapy are the following. These this statements are in our manuals. Um, so we base our treatment in these two beliefs. Again, that LGBTQ plus expressions are natural variations of humanity. Um, and the Latinx families can learn to support their children even if they do not agree with their sexual orientation 
or gender identity. So these are the two base of our work. And we share this with the families as well. So let's start a little bit talking about the approach. So first, the first, very first thing to do, which seems like very, for I guess for many therapists and counselor, like very basic, engage, gain the trust, right? Um, so with Latinx families, gaining the trust could be a little different from other families, right? Engaging means to show that you really, really, really care about their family and about the members of this family. So you may need to get a little more time to understand their context, where they're coming from, their beliefs and values, right? So first, if you're gonna work with a family, um, a Latinx families with an LGBTQ plus youth, if you want them to listen to you, you first really need to listen to them and they need to feel that you appreciate their belief system and them as a family. And one of, of one way of doing that is just to acknowledge, you know, acknowledge how important their values have been for them. Let's say if if they are um, if they're in any any particular religious belief they have. I don't want to say one versus the other, just any particular belief they have, spiritual belief they have. If that has been something that has supported them in difficult times or the church or any group in particular has been meaningful for them in moments of crisis, it's good to acknowledge that even though some of those beliefs may be in conflict with the acceptance of their team, and I will say this very carefully, you could provide and, and acknowledge how important it has been for them their belief without encouraging the belief, the belief in particular that reject their, their child. Um, so I will explain this uh, because I, I don't want to be misinterpreted in any way. Um, you can say, um, I see how the church has been for this family in times of crisis. Um, I, I can see how faith and hope have kept you together in difficult times. Uh, I, I, you know, it's, it's great to know that you have such a great support. You can say that without um, in any way affirming anything that they could say that means rejection to their child, right? So I wanna make this, this very clear. Um, we always will support um, and affirm the child. If they said, I'm so concerned that my kid may go to hell if they continue that path, in the first phase that you will see, you will listen, understand, but that piece that the person is saying, you will not encourage that belief. You will just understand the support that they have received from the bigger system. That's a way of showing respect without um, um, encouraging. That's the word, encouraging any distorted idea about being LGBTQ+. So, um, we have to be very careful and skillful in navigating uh, the different ideas and beliefs that Latinx families could have. So the first thing to do is you have to assess and understand when, where the family is. So please, next. So working with a family, the first thing that implies is that you need to assess. Assess and understand where the family is and where each of the family member is in terms of how they see sexual orientation, how they see gender identity, their level of acceptance, and, and any, any uh, beliefs or values that may interfere with their acceptance of their kid, and also see how they see their understanding of the connection between the teen sexuality, their gender identity, and their suicidality. 
like how they connect in their mind if there is any connection between the suicidal crisis and that part of their kid or child identity. Um, and so, so that's the first thing that you as a clinician, since the beginning, since the first uh, family session that we talk, that is part of the first assessment where you're listening the story of the suicidal crisis from each family member's perspective. You wanna see if they explain that there's the child or teen sexual orientation or gender identity has anything to do according to their mind. If the topic come up, you need to see how they express about that. If the teen already identify themselves um, with any particular gender identity, it, you need to see what are the pronouns and the names that the family use. All of those things you will be observing in that first family session. If they are tearful when they talk about their kid, if they're saying like the new name that they're using or the, the name that, that the teen is embracing, which is different from the name that their parents or caregiver gave them when they're a child in case of trans teens, you're observing all that. Um, so when you have the chance to talk with the parents alone, you can address and explore more. Um, because one of the things that we want to do as clinicians is to help the caregivers identify their own feelings and thoughts about adolescent sexuality and or gender identity. You need to understand it for yourself and you, you need to help the caregiver understand their thoughts and feelings toward the adolescent sexuality and gender identity. That's the first step. So they can then move on later on to different stages, right? So how we do that, right? The first, very first step is continue for the, for the, I mean, the first one is assessment. That's, that's the first one. That's what I'm saying here. Assessment um, of where each family member is and uh, help them understand their feelings and thoughts. And then uh, after assessing, once you have that engaged with the family, at the same time, basically you're engaging and you're doing that assessment. And then you move to use a non-judgmental approach, which is uh, the one that we have there, to help the parent um, understand those feelings and process their reactions to maybe this new. This is part of, of just uh, you know a, a, something new for them, like uh, the. the they just disclose them about their sexual orientation or gender identity, or maybe is very recent, uh, but you wanna help, help the family process what they're feeling and thinking. So the first is, again, from a non with a non-judgmental approach, um, which means assume their concerns are coming from a place of love for their teen, right? Um, Sometimes there's many people that have, again, we as human beings have different feelings um, depending on where we are in our own identity. Sometimes, I mean, I have worked with different clinicians. I have worked with clinicians, supervising clinicians that are part of the LGBTQ plus community and others that are not. Someone that is from the LGBTQ plus community themselves as a clinician may feel more distress or sometimes even anger when they have a parent in front of them that is not accepting or that is saying things that, and it will be hard to hear for anyone, right? So those that are also supervising needs to understand that if they were supervising another clinician. So we need to see where we are as well in this process and, and identify our own feelings of what we're hearing, right? If we have a parent that is, um expressing ideas that they have like wrong ideas of what is being lgbtq or they are highly critic of their kids and you know the pain that that is um affecting that 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 provoking the pain that is provoking and how they are affecting their teen so we also have to to have that in mind where are we right so in order to work with that if you're part of the LGBTQ community as a clinician, you have to assume that their concerns are coming 
as much as possible from a place of love, right? Because society is bad. We are in a, I mean, I'm not being um, all or negative. I'm not saying that also everything in society is bad, but we we are in a reality, as we discussed in the previous seminar, that there is a lot of uh, judgment and, and discrimination against the LGBTQ plus community. So our these are difficult days, right? And, and we have to assume that for parents and caregivers, it could be really hard to accept um, that. And they also have a lot of internalized homophobia and, and beliefs around what it is to be LGBTQ plus. So that's number one, understand that parents and caregivers reaction and concerns maybe linked to a process of grief. Um, for example, I'm seeing just a, I'm seeing a few families right now in which the, 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 their teen came out with a new gender identity, a new gender identity for the family. So for them is, for example, from having, um, let's say, a, a big sister to a big brother, right? So it's, it's new for the caregivers, if new for the other siblings. So there is a process of grief involved with all the expectations that they have of what it would be to be the mother or the father of this uh, boy or this girl, right? They have expectation with each gender. Um, and, and I think more strongly in the Latinx community, there's a lot of expectations that come with gender and the gender roles. So having, for example, that change is a process of grief. And we have to understand that as clinicians as well. So it will be important. So they move on to different phases, as you will see later on. You have to let them express their fears and concerns freely. We have to be prepared to listen to that. Um, so they, so it also a way of engaging with the family would be, um, even if what we're listening is not something that we would like to listen, we have to prepare for that and not to be eager to try to intervene immediately and provide them sick education and say, no, 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 you're wrong. That is, that is not how it is. You see, let me show you this. You, you have a wrong idea. That's why you're suffering so much. That's not the first intervention to make if you want to help them to have the full process, right? We need to let them grieve and express freely their fears and concerns. And in order to do that, we use tools that are provided that other people have worked with, which is amazing. And this is one that I use with my clients and I recommend everyone to use with their clients and is the educational film led with love. You can also use other video clips to show other parents' process and reactions. You don't have to use this one, but I mean, we want to use one that is properly done and, 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 and that is have evidence based supporting that. Um, this Let With Love film is free, is online, is a, is, is available online. It's a 30 minute documentary about caregivers um, that their kids came up to them at some point in their life and their process, right? And it's, it's, it shows like the, the the youth perspective and the caregiver's perspective and their first reaction and their progress. Some some caregivers were more in shock, others were more accepting, others explained their, their journey to accept their kid. Here it is, yes. I, I. So um, it's based on sexual orientation, it's not based on gender identity. But you can use a lot of that to apply as well to issues related to gender identity. Um, I would encourage everyone to go and see it first before putting to, you know, use this with any of their clients. And we use these questions with the parents. It's in English. Um, I think there's, there's a version that have the, um, the Spanish word in the bottom. And uh, so that's that's a limitation with this film. Um, if they understand, it's very easy to understand. So if they speak a little, you know, a little English, they may be able to understand and you can pause and explain. I have clinicians here that they 
see like a section, for example, they pause, they ask, how do you feel about what you're hearing? You know, um, did you understand everything? Um, so we, these are just some of the samples, samples of the questions that we ask. What did you think about the film? Where are you aspiring in that process from surprise to acceptance? And, and that's what I like about the, this film that is showing like experience that caregivers could relate to. Uh, could you relate to any of the family members? What are your questions and concern about your child? Um, so this is a very nice way of like breaking the ice in terms of, you don't have to pretend with me if this is hard. I mean, and, and let me do this clarification again. This doesn't mean that every Latinx family will be in the same place in shock or not accepting. No, we have had families that, that way, when they um, came to us, they are already in the acceptance phase where they are even, you know, sheer, being cheerful or, or very supportive of their, of their child. Um, but there are others that are not there, right? Or they're maybe in the middle of their journey and, and you need to know where they are. And if they haven't seen this film, it's, it's, a, it's a very nice place to start. And why? I will please the next one. In this film, and I, I think the previous one has the reference, you could look up that reference that I put there up, uh, at the bottom of the slide. It's, a, it's a, an article, an article published that, that helps you also give you some more guidance about how to use the Let With Love uh, film. What is nice about this film that it was done using these faces, the, the model of change, right? And the model of change uh, has this basis in which you could be in a pre-contemplator phase, contemplator phase, or preparation and action phase, right? Um, so you will not, of course, ask the, your caregivers that you're seeing in which, in which phase you are. No, this is your judge as a clinician also assess, right? Assess, assess, assess where they are. You will um, check based on their answers and what they have said so far, where are they in this uh, model of change? If they are in that pre-contemplator phase where they are basically maybe in shock or just got the news, many caregivers could be in their, in their process of grieving, confusion. How is that? Like, I don't understand how concern, like so many concerns. Then what you need to do as clinician is just to understand how painful this could, can be. And, and reflect that to them and say, you know, I, I get how this could be so overwhelming or painful. All of you know how to reflect and provide support. If they are in a contemplator phase, they, um, they are maybe ready to learn more about the LGBTQ community, gain some insight about, um, where this true pain come, like because they have a lot of misinformation and wrong ideas about what is being LGBTQ plus. So if they're there, like curious, like they already passed the grief and they're like, okay, I really want to understand my child. But could, could you explain to me? Like I, then you you know that the person is in a contemplator phase and you can then provide more evidence-based information because they are ready to hear that. So what I'm saying with this, you cannot try to push sick education for someone that is in the pre-contemplator first, just grieving. You have to stay with them a little bit there. And that's a way of engaging, understanding, respecting, and then after they grieve, they express their concern or all the ideas, then you can move with them to the contemplator phase in which you provide more evidence-based information. Um, and in that phase, also, you provide uh, more information about the rejection versus acceptance idea, which you can find in the acceptance project. And I will show you um, later, later, like um, how you can use this, how, to, how you can use that, that information to help them go to the right direction of avoiding being, doing rejecting behavior and doing more acceptance behavior, right? Um, so you motivate them for change in this phase. If your caregiver is already in the, I'm ready, I just want to support my child. I'm ready to do whatever he or she need or they need 
to feel better, you know, and if they already have the information, then you can connect them, connect them with resource in the community, with other support groups, um, and provide specific guidance and modeling. Okay, you want to do something extra, what can you do? Let have you tell your child about what type of support they need at this point, how you can support them. Maybe it would be, you know, the, the pride months just passed, maybe it's go with them to the parade, right? And and put a t-shirt and say, I'm a supportive parent of an LGBTQ youth, right? So we cannot expect that from everyone, but there will be people ready for that. So that's why we need to see where they are. So after they see this film with you, um, they film and, and they propose um, also some guidelines for the family, right? So the first idea is to grieve with them, listen to them, help them move um, and discuss the film as I show you with those questions. But then you want to let them know like the very basic that they need to do in order to protect their child. And the very basic is this led with love or dirige con amor in Spanish, right? They have some booklets in both languages, in English and Spanish, and I have there the um, reference. And also if you look online, again, this is free. You can look for led with love and there's like um, some guidelines that you can give to the family and you can help them uh, understand each of these concepts. So the, le the first concept is let your affection show right? So if you want to let your affection show, is your, I'm sorry, just focus on your love, right? How do you show your affection to your, to your youth? Can you see, can you tell him or tell her or tell them you love them? Could you hug them? Could you watch a movie with them? Could you um, just listen to them? How you show your affection? That's what they need at this point. Right, that's the first step. Second, express your pain away from your child. We understand where, that you are in pain. And we have had to say this to parents many times because they are tearful, they are affected and say, when they have a partner, you know, you have each other, talk to each other, you know, like, like uh, Suffer with each other, all the concerns that you have. Keep it to yourself or look for a best friend if you don't have a partner, you know, but don't show your pain in front of your child. They have enough. They are suffering enough for you to be saying to them how hard it is for you to learn and understand about their sexual orientation. Right. So we try to help them navigate what's appropriate and what's not. So the grief is fine. It's OK. We support you, understand you. But please don't do it in front of your child. Avoid rejecting behaviors. Right. You don't have to agree, but you don't have to show rejection. You don't have to put a face of disgust. You don't have to say mean words. You don't have to criticize. Right. You can do, and then all of the things that you could do that is different from avoiding rejecting behaviors, right? Um, and do good before you feel good. You don't have to feel completely good and convinced and have everything clear and have all the sequelization understanding in the world to do good, right? Um, you want to protect your child, you want to support them, then let's then. Uh, support them and give affirmative words instead of credits or rejection. So this is the very basic. I say this is one on one for a parent that are just like, I don't know what to do. Oh, come on. I will show you what you need to do. It's very basic. For now, let's just keep with this as a safeguard. Um, and again, you can show them, you can see the movie, see where they are, let them grief, then provide these uh, guidelines that you can print in English or Spanish, share with them. This is the basic for now that, that, that they need from you. Okay, so I want now that all of you um, take a minute, if possible, to be comfortable in your, in your chair, wherever you are, 
and uh, relax a little bit. If you can close your eyes, I will appreciate. Um, don't see the camera, don't look at me for a minute. We will do a short exercise. Um, so close your eyes and I want you to imagine that you're getting into a time machine. You get it in the time machine and we set up that time machine for your high school years. I want you to recreate in your mind how was your look and style, your interests, your peers, your friends when you were in high school? Try to picture yourself back then. This is a machine that went to your past and you can see yourself there. Now I want you to focus your attention to any time at that age when you felt excluded or criticized or make fun of. Think, why was that? Were you different from the rest in any way? Was there any part of your identity that was not welcomed by the rest? Were you chored or an immigrant or somewhere coming from a very different town or a different hairstyle or skin color? What was it? If so, if you were rejected, criticized, or make fun at any time where you were in high school, how did you know? Did you receive a direct message from anyone? Or it was indirect ones because of what they did or didn't do? It was that everything, everyone did a party and you were excluded? How did you know? that you were not part of that group. Stay there for a moment and try to remember your feelings, your thoughts. What would happen to you if that feeling of exclusion or rejection would have been a constant in your everyday life during many years while you were in middle school, in high school, every year failing, rejected or excluded. And with that feeling, I want you to get back to your time machine and let's come back to the present time. So we are now, again, here, 2022. You're old again, or older. <laughs> Take a deep breath. Okay. So could you imagine having your teen or a teen going through a situation like this every day, thinking that they may be rejected, because of their sexual orientation or gender identity, or that that rejection would be from their parents, which is the people that's supposed to accept them and love them the most. So the purpose of this exercise is to get an idea of how LGBTQ plus youth may feel when they are the constant target of negative comments attacks or are excluded or even not represented in the mainstream discussions at school or family or media or anything in a normal way, right? Uh, so this, this exercise is some of the things that we can use to um, help parents be em empathize with their kid, right? We use this exercise in many different ways. We adjust it. This is just one version of it. We adjust it according to maybe what parents need to hear to be able to empathize with their team. Um, so they can 
the idea is that they can put themselves in their teen's shoes. That's why you see all those shoes there. So the idea is put yourself in your teen's shoes. If there were anything um, similar, to see if there was anything similar that they can relate to, um, to be more empathic and understanding. So as you see um, in this part, what we wanted to do is to help the parents be first, I will summarize again where, where we are up to this point, um, engage, assess, provide support and understanding, right? Helping, helping, help, helping them see where they're at, you see where they're at, and um, and know that they are not the only caregivers that have had a process or difficult situations. That's why led with love is one option. See other parents that have gone through a process of grief and that they're different processes, right? Um, I, before going to this point, I just remember, I want to also emphasize that every parent or each parent could be in a different place. And even with this, uh, right, even this exercise could be feel different for, for each parent. And I know that last time someone asked the question, what do you do when you have parents that are in different stages? Again, you would not, you know, you, you, when you do this assessment and you have two parents or two parents and a, a grandparent, seeing this movie and you ask them, each of them differently, where are you in that phrase? Like, I'm in shock. Oh no, I, I already accept them where they are. You know, you hear that and you also have to explain the other caregivers that they need to accept and respect each person process. We're just working with a family that the parent is very accepting and he's using the pronouns and it's a, it's a trans a teen. They're using the pronouns, the correct name, but the mom had more difficulty and then the parent was kind of um, kind of poaching mom. We were, I cannot say in a mean way, but was kind of, uh, you can feel like maybe, maybe a little rude because he was more, more advanced, right? So also we need to create the space and explain, you know, every person have a different pace and they feel this in a different process. So even with that, that was most accepting, we were like, oh, we're so happy that you're there, that you're so accepting, but let's also, mom have their own process of grief, mom is trying, you know, we, we were encouraging both to keep going on their process, but, but help also that understand that, that you, you know, that it's okay that mom still cry, that is okay that mom still struggle, but that she's trying, that she's, we are seeing the effort that she's using and trying to use the, the correct pronouns, you know, and she says sorry if she doesn't use the correct one, you know, to the teen. So she's in the process. And we also help the teen understand from his per, their perspective that that is a process for them and that they are trying and we're celebrating. It's an adjustment. It's a new, we also use the analogy of this is, you know, is in a crisis when you have a newborn, everyone has to adjust. It's not that it's good or bad, it's that you're adjusting because every, the family is a system and you're reconnecting in different ways. So if we have a new family member and they see it, you know, in the care of, of a, a trans person, not necessarily the sexual orientation, but a trans person, you are reconnecting to an, a new person in the family. So this is an adjustment and everyone does this differently. Um, so that to answer that question from last session, but the same, you know, even if it's sexual orientation it was not something that was not expected for you, your expectation for your child was here and now maybe it's this direction, it's a different direction that, that you had and we need to adjust. Um, so that's a way of, of setting the base for respecting where each family member is. Um, so this one, the 
basically the next phase after the pre-contemplator, remember the contemplator phase, is kind of provide accurate information about sexual orientation and gender identity, right? It's not an illness, but a normal part of human diversity. And we wanna do this with evidence, right? Um, help caregivers understand uh, the relation between rejection and negative health outcomes. So a little bit more of information. And with this, we use the family acceptance studies. We explain how caregivers' behaviors, words, comments, body language, and decisions relate to the teen's well-being. For that part of psychoeducation, we provide uh, these pamphlets that, again, they are in Spanish and English and is free. You can just print it online. And about how rejection may put their kids at higher risk of suicidal behavior, of drug use, of HIV. They have different um, different measures of well-being, and this is this is based on studies. So you can show that it's very graphic like this. This is just a piece of of of, of um, their book, um, and you have the reference there um, about how. Um, low rejection reduce the risk, mother re rejection and high rejection, how much more an LGBTQ young people could be at risk of suicide if they feel rejected by their family members. So we can, when they're ready, provide this. So they can also have the support and your words can have support. Like, you know, like we want you to be able to Again, led with love, um, avoid rejection, promote affirm affirmations and acceptance. So this is a way of supporting that. This is the evidence that says that just if you provide affection and love and avoid rejection, you are reducing the risk of a suicide attempt or, or, or um, any other type of um, negative behavior. So that's you know a progressive way, but it doesn't mean that it has to be in this order, right? It's, it's all the ingredients that you need to have, but you have to see where, where the family is. So provide affirmation, right? We um, explain to the parents words that they can use. You can provide examples. Um, in, in the social cognitive therapy approach, we role play we find with them things that they could say to the kids that could be nice and affirmative for them right uh, you're brave you're intelligent you're funny i appreciate you um, of course we encourage them to use all the time and, and we explain the importance of use the correct pronouns uh, their name the name they chose um, that's something that we explain and you know and when i was saying at the beginning to engage the family and not necessarily do an immediate intervention um i was saying uh, immediate intervention as not to try to correct them immediately of wrong ideas but but in the cases that we have that actually not using the correct pronouns was uh, triggering a suicidal behavior we definitely since the beginning we explain you know this is important if we try since the beginning to use the pronouns that they that they have expressed you to use in the case that of course the teens are already out to their parents and caregivers um so we encourage that as a way of affirming their kid i as i said in the first seminar the coming out process is the teen's process, is not mine. So of course, if the teen has not disclosed that they want their caregivers to use a different pronoun, of course, we will not do that disclosure in front of, of the parents. Then we, we are the ones that have to switch their names and pronouns according to the process where they, where they are in the coming out with their family members and parents. So we have, you have to be very 
aware of switching depending on who you're talking to, um, according to what they know. So we can always provide affirmation. Um, we also give um, for the parents, I have to say for the parents that do not know that their kids have um, a diverse sexual orientation or gender identity, but we know that the teen want to disclose at any point. And even if they don't want to disclose right now, we try to prepare the caregivers by having a session that is just directed to help them provide affirmation to their teens. And we use this word in a very um, general way, right? We explain why it's so important for them to build self-esteem in their youth, right? So we use that way to talk about the same topics without talking about the topics. When, with this, I'm saying we're talking about building self-esteem and avoiding rejection and criticism, even though they don't know that the kid has um, is part of the LGBTQ community or is questioning, right? So in some way, we're preparing the caregiver for any point in the future that the teen decide to come out, they will already have the information, we have process, we have discussed the importance of providing support, acceptance, and affirmation to their teen, even though there's things that they would not agree upon. And, and when when they don't know about their sexual, the sexual orientation of their teen or their gender identity, we use other examples that is not the same, of course, as the sexual orientation and gender identity, but we need to use some something of their identity to explain the caregiver. So we go with things like the way they like to dress or the, the music that they would like, like to explain, you may not always like everything about your teen. You may not like the way they dress. You may not like the music they listen to. You may not like what they decide to do, like after high school, what they wanna study. You may not like that. You may not agree on certain ideas they have about religion or life, but they're growing toward independence. And after all, that's what you want, that they are willing to think and take decisions by themselves. So even if you don't agree, how can you support your team? How can you provide affirmation that they feel safe, that you love them, even though you don't agree? So you get what I'm saying? I hope everyone is with me in this we can prepare the caregivers even if if the topic of sexual orientation and gender identity is still not over the table or on the table because the teen not because of us because the teen has decided to hold on to that information because it's their decision to come out but i can i i certainly can prepare the caregivers by by providing the approach um as I explained just here about the importance of providing affirmation and support, even if they don't agree with certain aspects of their teen's um, identity or different ways of seeing life or, or thinking and so and so. Okay, so for the caregivers that do know and is on the table, their teen's sexual orientation and gender identity, we could also move forward and also help the caregivers questions, question the negative and inflexible thought they may have about the LGBTQ community. So they can understand and lower their pain, right? Because sometimes they believe, oh, my teen will never be able to have a family, right? For example, because they think that, what is the concept they have about family? What is the concept? Like they think that, or some, again, some caregivers, I'm not talking about every LGBTQ parent. Um, we have a lot of diversity in our community, but for those that have misconceptions, we can help them by providing evidence-based information. Like what is family for you then? You know, what is it? What is a, you know, is it just uh, like family has to be a male or a female? Does, oh, they will never be able to have child. Like, well, there's people that have child now with different alternative ways, or they can all, always adopt, or they can use uh, 
if they want to, maybe they don't want to have any child. I'm just saying, like, like there's certain idea that that they suffer so much, like they will be so unhappy and no one will want them. And, and we can work around those ideas about where are those ideas coming from? Again, to help the parents reduce their pain because sometimes that pain is based on false ideas as the pains that the teens have, right? Or um, sometimes not if they're saying, oh, I'm, I'm like parents, I'm scared for the well-being of my kid. What if someone uh, tried to 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 harm them? I mean, it's it's not based on uh, um, on irrational ideas that LGBTQ people could be at more risk of being uh, uh, you know a target of of violence. I'm not. I sadly. That's, that's not, and unfortunately it is true that that could happen, but there's safe places and there are safe communities and there's supportive community. And that's the point that we will try to, to, to you know, to, in, to encourage them to think. Um, and then they could also be part of that encouraging and, and loving and supporting community. Um, so I will go back to the cognitive restructuring, the next one. So we could, as we do with the teen, we also would need to do this cognitive restructuring with the parents. Um, so when they present with a core belief that is attached to their pain, I mean suffering, I mean to their pain and suffering related to their uh, child LGBTQ identity, we need to take the time to question those thoughts, as I was saying, and then ask, like, where are those ideas coming from, right? Um, and then say, okay, there's some people that believe that, but let's let's look for the facts, right? Um, it is normal, and then say it is normal to have certain ideas because we were thought that blah 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 blah. Like, family is dad, mom. Pepito for more times, the dog and the cat, like for example, and the child, female, uh, uh, male siblings, one, one like this, this traditional, you know, of beliefs about what family is. But is it is it that? Like even look around your family, like how is your family? Like talk to me about your family. So sometimes even the beliefs could be questions by their own background. Like if they see their family. Uh, they could see that, oh, well, yes, I have an aunt and I think she's lesbian. She always have lived with a roommate and they're really happy. And oh, yes, and how, how you know? well, like everyone said, but no one knows, you know, like, like oh, I mean, everyone knows, but no one said, right, anything about it. Or, you know, yes, I have this uncle, I remember this neighbor and, and how was the neighbor, you know? There are people in the community that they know, maybe another son or, or, or a sister. In every family, there are representations of LGBTQ population. Um, so we have to look for those good role models. Of course, there, there will be bad role models and good role models. You will look for positive role models uh, to question the ideas, right? And and. And, and if you if they don't have any positive role model in their family or in their community, then we have to look for the media and see what respectful figures they may know that are part of the LGBTQ community and they are doing perfectly well and they are they are productive members of society, right? And they have a family and they this and they that. Um, so if we begin maybe in the within their own knowledge you can find ways of questioning the negative ideas that they may have about the lgbtq plus community so this is again a way of look for positive models use positive role models to help challenge negative thoughts right and particularly we have um i mean a, a lot of the um, Latinx community, uh, mostly second generation in um, 
or first generation, they, they have strong religious values. And it will be good to ask them, sometimes there are positive role model, even within the spiritual movement or a church, or you can find if they're part of the religious community, you can find other pastors or um, leaders from other religious movements that are LGBTQ supportive, so they can see that not all religions are uh, against the LGBTQ plus community. Um, so that could be very helpful for some parents and also for LGBTQ youth that are themselves uh, of a particular religion and they believe that no one else in the religion may be or if they have guilt or feeling rejected because they feel they are the only one in the world that are, let's say, Christian and gay or bisexual, right? Um, which is not true. There's a lot of more movement with time of, of groups that are supportive in, in a lot of different religions. Um, so it could be helpful for the parents to see that there are others um, spiritual movement that support the LGBTQ community. Um, and also um, to question certain ideas about, about their beliefs. So I, I would say this, I remember one case that was consulted to me about um, a mom that was being seen by a clinician. The mom was, um, very religious and, and was super, super, um, I would say, uh, apprehensive or, or very uh, rejecting was like, it was really hard for her. Like she was having a really, really hard time uh, even acknowledging their teen um, identity. Um, and the teen was super suicidal, like feeling so rejected, like my mom, my mom could not even see me, right? It's like the person that's supposed to love me the most is not even acknowledging me with my identity. So very suicidal. And um, the, the, the mom all the time was um, alluding to her spiritual belief to reject um, her child, her teen, right? Um, so that the clinician was trying to convince the mom, maybe from more an evidence-based psychoeducation perspective, about how how um, her behavior is affecting the child. So I say, okay, well, let let let's let's take a different approach. What about have you ever asked her? what and, and I, I would use the example if she was a christian woman right so i asked her have you ever asked her what jesus would would have done in her place um have you asked her what does she think about when jesus interfered with the people that were coming with stones to to heat on you know to to um throw uh, stones to the woman that according to all of them was a prostitute and that she needs to be punished. Um, have you ever asked her what this mean for her? Like that God is love and you should love your, you know, your others as, as you love yourself, which is like the first, uh, you know, belief is you love yourself, God over all, and then others as you love yourself. Have you asked her what does that mean for her? how she interpreted that in this situation with, with her, her child, her teen. And, and, and she said, oh, I never thought about that. I never thought about using her own beliefs to question her position toward, toward her child. And I said, hmm, yeah. So, you know, that's, that's something that if that's, if that's the barrier for a caregiver, to be more accepting to their child, if that's the reason, then you have to get very simple. I'm not saying that anyone has to be like having a master in religion or in Bible, but just get the basic and ask them according to their own beliefs, 
what does love means in their religion? What does what does the God loves mean in their religion? What does that mean if they believe in Jesus? Like, what was Jesus' approach when everyone was with stones and rejecting? What does she believe? And then I don't know what happened with the case. I have to. <laughs> that was just a, a a quick consultant, so I don't know what happened. But I I would hope that at least at least it was a different twist for for this mom. I, I really hope that at least something or at some degree she could be um, less uh, hard with, with, with her kid. And also, you know, everyone has a free will, but what would you do with the will that you have? Um, so those are examples, right? Uh, of, and there's a lot of more, you know, things that you gain with experience, but if you have questions, the other thing I would recommend everyone to do is always have another another uh, colleague or professional that has had more experience with the LGBTQ community or that they are more experienced of providing affirmative care where you can consult cases and read more as well. You know, there's a lot of, I'm sorry, readings out there about an affirmative approach do i mean i'm happy i cannot see anyone's face but I, all of you are doing what you need to do you know what we need to do you know to just get more information when we feel we need it and keep learning and learning i'm learning every day uh, of my cases and other people um just to be able to keep up of how to have the best care for for my clients and my families uh so that's another brief uh, suggestion I will give. Have someone that you trust of, of their work and consult if you need to. So this is kind of in conclusion, I want to give at least 20 minutes for questions. Uh, definitely we can make a difference in someone's life and I, this work for me is in my heart. I think each family that you can touch is being to be more open and more accepting is definitely improving the life of a team that will as well affect others in their ways as in their way as they grow um but we definitely have to be also accepting and affirming to the caregivers that are also suffering and help them move along their process um we all can intervene by providing affirmative and supportive care to the youth and to the caregivers um, we can create safe spaces for the team to be themselves and for the family to grieve in, in, and, re and receive the psychoeducation they need and receive the understanding they need to move along. Um, and I, I mean, and again, talking about the youth, we can openly explore sexual orientation and gender as a normal aspect of human development. So if you develop, I mean, these are the guidelines and the worksheets that we use, but you can develop your own and, and as part of the aspect of adolescence and, and, and adolescent development and, and how adolescents develop their identity, you can have different aspects and just say, okay, let's talk about this, let's talk about this, let's talk about that. And very normally talk about sexual orientation and gender identity so they can explain where they are in a very open way. Uh, I think they all will appreciate them, even if they are, Part of the LGBTQ plus community or not, because they are saying, oh, this person knows, you know, is sexuality is normal. That's good, you know, and they will open up. And if they're in along the way, they're questioning anything, they will be, they will feel free to discuss that with you. You know, it's sad when I have heard that there are teens that have been years in therapy with someone and they have never expressed uh about their sexual orientation. So what does that is telling you? They, they didn't have the, the freedom or, or feel like was confident enough to talk about their questions. So we should provide explanation that that safe space to talk about this freely and in affirmative way. So that's just um, a way of saying diver diversity is cool. Right, and I would like to open for questions. If, if I would love to have some questions next, I would like if anyone can, you know, if you want to take pictures of this next slide, the, the next one, 
you know, th those are um, some of the reference for the books. The Trevor Project is the hotline specifically for LGBTQ youth. Um, I mean, now would be just one number, I think is, is 411 for every suicidal crisis or mental health crisis. Um, so it will not be this long number anymore, but the Trevor Project is the, you know, the, the online resource to go and check. They have a lot of data actually as well about uh, LGBTQ youth and how they're affected. Um, and there's also a chat where they could get like support. And then those are the, uh, the workbooks that, I mean, those workbooks, you can, you can um, buy them, these two. And the other ones at the end, resource, the first two, I'm not related with these people at all, are just two good handbooks that you can use. And the last, which has resources to work with caregivers, those are the things that you can find online available free uh, that I use myself in my project and in my clinical practice. So is there any question, Eric, that have come up in the chat that we could address now? Yes, hi. Um, well, as of now, um, I do have uh, a comment, um, not so much a question, but a comment that I would like to put out there. Religiously integrated TBT model is very helpful with the appropriate training uh, with um, those cases in which family is very inflexible with religious aspects that are affecting a member. So that's a comment from one of our audience members um, around this, uh, the treatment models you've been explaining. Yeah, yeah. I'll, 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 we have a, a, a few minutes left, so I'll, I'll be encourage anyone who has any questions to feel free and, and, and send them over we'll, our way and we can address them to, uh, to Dr. Duarte. Um, in the meantime, I'll ask everybody should be able to see here. We please don't forget to complete our evaluation, and I will send in later the evaluation link. But you can also, with even with your phone, uh, scan the QR code uh, for this presentation. This way, it's important for us to get so many great speakers and experts in the field. Also, um, I uploaded the handout. Uh, in the GoToWebinar uh, uh, app that you should be using, should, you should be able to download it. Um, so anybody who you know uh, wanted to get that those handouts, you can feel free to uh, download it there, there or in our website, which is listed here. We have a lot of great resources, uh, same as uh, Dr. Duarte Vélez, working on different themes um, and topics around mental health with Latin. Latino and Latinx uh, communities. Um, and let's see if we have a question here. Well, I have one question to address, um, and this is, goes back to maybe one of the questions that was asked in the last uh, presentation. Uh, is there any point in treatment uh, where it's more appropriate to meet with parents separately um, than with a child or teenager? Okay. Maybe separate se session, etc. For any any other reason. Say that the last part, please, again. Yeah. Is there any point in treatment where it'd be more appropriate to meet with the parents separately? Is there any times where it's better to address certain topics in conjunct or together with the teen in okay. session? Yeah. Oh, good. Yes. So, um, I think it will. That's a depends a lot of on your clinical judgment. You, um, but I would say um, you always have to assess how they feel about the sexual orientation and gender identity. I would say only apart with the caregivers um, to give them the chance to express freely where they are. For example, I just have a family session recently where the topic was discussed because it's on the table, right? The, this aspect of their identity that is new to the parents and the family. So we have a family session with this 
overall. Um, in in that session, I I want to be encouraging and positive about what they have done as a family to support the team. So I would not assess in a family session in front of the team how they felt when they got the news that their teen is, let's say, bisexual or have a, is trans. I would not do that in front of the teen. That's a conversation to have alone with the parents. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, again, as a family, I encourage the positive that they have done, how they support each other, how they support the teen, that is an adjustment from everyone, that everyone is at a different pace. You know, that's the things I kind of acknowledge with all of them together. Um, and any positive thing that they have said in front of the teen, I will get that to reframe and end the session in a positive tone. That's what I would do as a family, individually with the parents, I will definitely get, uh, you know, have my session individually with the teen to go over identity. And I will have my separate session with the parent as, I mean, as the protocol also uh, encourage is that like a family, individual, and then parents, right? So each have the time apart to express where, where, where are they in terms of everything, how they understand the suicidal crisis, if there was anything. And I always ask, is there anything that, was not saying the family session that you want to say now that you're just with me. And so we can have, well, yes, I didn't tell this in front of so-and-so, but I would like to say this, right? And, and so that's one of the questions. And also there is that I ask, okay, so I, I saw that it, it was kind of, that you had a hard time saying this or, you know, this person said that it has been hard for you to accept this person as a new member in the family, like this new identity. How do you feel about that? Tell me a little bit more about that. And then you can hear whatever the parent want to say in a safe place, because obviously you don't want the teen to listen to that. Um, that so makes that, a lot of sense, yeah. That's very important, I that's, would say. Yeah, no, that, that's a wonderful, I, I think, clinical insight into how to work separately. It, uh, as we we're saying, both with with the parents, but uh, with the child separate sessions. And we have a few questions that have, have been brought here. Uh, Jasmine Alvarez asks: Is there any formal education program or course where we can learn more about these interventions with the community? So, uh, meaning about the social cognitive behavioral therapy model? Well, it doesn't uh, specify. Uh, I'm assuming within this uh, intervention. Oh, the LGBTQ yeah. community, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I will answer both. So if it's about the LGBTQ community specifically, uh, I know actually that the National Hispanic and Latino Technology Transfer Center, they have a lot of other uh, webinars online that you can see um, of other professionals. I know Miguel Vasquez is another very good one that speaks a little bit more about maybe other aspects in general about the LGBTQ plus community. Um, that's, and there's different seminars there. Mm -hmm. If, if right. it's about the social cognitive, I would appreciate if you could send your email to me. I have my emails around there. At some point, I will put a workshop of people that want to have like a more formal training about the social community behavioral therapy for suicide behavior. So I'm taking the names, the emails of people that are interested. So at some point I will provide like a more formal training with the whole thing. But I, I would love, you know, people that are interested, just send me your information to that email and I will put you on, a, yeah. uh, on my you. list. That's wonderful. We have so many great questions here. So um, I'm going to move along to to a next one that might be insightful. Uh, this, this comes from um, Ellie Beck Rodriguez. What kind of homework do you give to caregivers when they leave your sessions do, so they can continue to work uh, on themselves outside of the sessions? Yeah, that's a great question. Well, honestly, the first after the first family session, what we do is just to it's a family project. So we, we call personal project 
and family project it's instead of homework. We have CBT said homework, we said family project, personal project when it's all, only the team. So in the family project, the first assignment is to find an activity that they could do as a family that is not controversial, no tension, anything that could provide it's a time to have fun, to relax, something that everyone enjoy. So that's the first simple um, assignment. Um, so they could just spend some time together and lessen the tension. Uh, in terms of the process that they need to go through, in terms of the process, you know, their, their journey of acceptance, um, it, it's really very, um, tailor to their family for example i have asked them let's say if if they haven't watched the, the whole documentary to see them by themselves to see if they have questions uh, some of the clinicians choose to see it in with them in the session um so we can say you know come with any question for the next one um you can ask them to write in a journey i mean a Oh my god, diary, diary, that diary, or help me with the word, the yeah, the, uh, the diary, yeah, diary, <laughs> <laughs> like Sometimes their thoughts, it, yeah. a journal, is that it's a, a journal? Oh, 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 well, yeah, journal, oh, write a journal, of course, so yeah, write down their feelings and thoughts. That's a way that they can use to canalize their thoughts instead of speaking out their thoughts to their to their team or other family member, maybe they can write down all their concerns in a, in a uh, journal. Um, so that's basically really, you know, depending on the phase they are, you can assign something. It's more tailored according to what you think is more proper for them. You know, if it's, if they are on the pre-contemplator and they need to grieve. Ask them to write down their thoughts and feelings if in, and their reactions, even of doing it, write it down when they see this or that. So we can discuss further uh, as a family to do an activity together that is for fun. No, you know, with, that doesn't provoke any other issues. And if they are on the contemplator phase, you can, have, you can tell them and activate them a little bit and go online and look for um, search for evidence-based websites, get more information and answer their questions and concerns, right? Um, so we have to be very tailored to, to them, I would say to each person. But that could, I hope that that could give an idea of things that you can ask them to do. Yeah, that's great. Uh, Watch so... movies, documentaries. There, there's mm -hmm. really good, you know, other good documentary. There's a, the, the, there's a campaign that is the coming out, the, it, it, it gets better. You can ask them to watch a few videos, but you know, I, I usually ask them to see things that I already have seen. I don't like to send them just to see whatever, because I don't know what would be the content on, on how, you know, there's a lot of different ideas out there. So I prefer to send them to see things that I already have mm -hmm. seen. Yeah, that, that's, uh, yeah, as was mentioned, uh, as part of the process, you had mentioned some movies that w could be resourceful. Uh, speaking of resources, I would like to uh, let everyone know that the MHTT Center by tomorrow should be uploading one of our uh, books um, around LGB LGBTQ interventions with Hispanic and Latinx uh, groups. And that covers many great uh, reading material and, uh, for treatment from uh, minority stress models, to even a, um, a series of um, of terms uh, used by the LGBT community, uh, co uh, coping strategies uh, that can it may, can be a very resourceful book. Uh, I think we have time for one more question. Um, um, I'm going to read it uh, very shortly, um, and it comes from Diana Mejia Cruz. Uh, the talk was very interesting. I would like to know about the experience of work with monoparental caregivers. Um, I mean, I don't, I don't think there's any different from. I mean, it's different in the sense 
obviously is very different in the sense that they have less help from another person. But I, I don't think it will be different in terms of the approach. It will be the same approach uh, with someone that is racing by themselves uh, and than with someone that is with other caregiver or even extended family members. As I said before, we have had mom, dad, and a grandmother or a mom and a grandmother in the same household, right? Or just single parents. Um, I think it's the same approach. I, the only complicated things when there's different, more persons is that you have to see where each person is. If it's a, a, a single parent or a single caregiver, um, I, I think in some ways maybe easier because you're just working with one perspective, right? Um, and then you, you want them to, again, you will have to do the same, understand where this person is and help them support their child. Um, there's also situations when there's, you have a, a single caregiver and there's someone outside, that's also another complication. And the person outside, the other caregiver does not know what the household, the main household know in terms of sexual orientation and gender identity. So they're coming out maybe different in one family, you know, one household versus the other. Um, and that's a little more complicated as well. So you would need to do the same repeated in this other household, you know, like the process that you start here, you will have to start it with the other household as well. So, so everyone can have the process start going and, 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 and see where they are and see how they can support their kids. So is, is I would say that the only difference is you are working with one perspective. But of course, there's always in the Latinx family, you have extended family, you have you have different views, right? And you, you know, when you have one parent at some point, you want to support the parents to the point that the, that this caregiver could support their teen in front of the extended family. That's another topic, but you need, you know, you, you need to provide as much support as possible so they can affirm their teen with other family members and the family members, again, they have their own ideas and process about what they think about sexual orientation and gender identity. So it's, it's complicated and, it, you know, it's a, it's a process, but sorry, I have to say that it's very um, um, fulfilling and, and good to see how parents come from one place of maybe shock and rejection to accepting and supporting, I think it's possible. We have seen it. And, you know, I hope that everyone at least have some guidelines to start that process of supporting their caregivers to be more accepting of their LGBTQ plus teens. Well, thank you so much. Um, I'll go ahead and put my camera on to say goodbye to everyone. But we, we are so grateful and uh, for this excellent presentation and and so pleased and to have Dr. Joan Scalward to join us. Um, be sure, as uh, uh, Dr. Duarte mentioned, to uh, go to our website. Uh, as I mentioned, the book uh, that will be coming out by this Friday, you can check it out in the website and, and download it. We also hope to have maybe in a week or two this presentation itself uploaded, uh, and which you can also see other great presentations in our YouTube channel from many other great speakers and experts in the field. So thank you very much and I hope you all have a wonderful day or afternoon or morning wherever you may be. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.